Welcome to Sounds Like Portraits. I'm Philippe Unger. This is a conversation with creative humans. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher or Google Podcasts. Sounds Like Portraits is also available on Frenchly.us. If you like this show, remember to leave us a five-star rating on iTunes or a review. It really helps new listeners find us. Thank you. In this episode, you'll hear Andy Fraberg, tax director at GIP, a private equity fund which goes to investors to generate returns for them. Andy has to find a way to put together all the promises GIP has made to investors with all the tax regulations that apply. That's the big picture. What first attracted Andy to tax? The answer is his passion for classification. That's where his creativity lies. As Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes once said, taxes are what we paid for a civilized society. Even if, I would add, we always ask for a discount. Where is the creativity in tax systems? That's the question of the week. It's time to listen to him, but to start, he told me what he tried to do all his life. All my life, I have always tried to do my best at whatever it is that I set my mind to do. I've regretted in some ways some of the things I have set my mind to do, but I usually make a very serious effort to be as dedicated and detailed um, and meticulous. What were his regrets about? Oh, my, <laughs> I think lots of my youthful decisions. But as I got to my older teens, I finally figured out that maybe I was going down the wrong path. And so I decided I would try to make things better. And I think I've mostly been on the straight and narrow since then. How did you become a corporate tax lawyer? Hmm. If you had told me that I would end up being a tax attorney, I would have laughed in your face when I was young. Um, the way it happened was really because of one professor at law school. Uh, I resisted going to law school for a very long time. Um, it seemed to me at some level to be the last refuge of the scoundrel, as many people say. Um, I decided I would try it after going through several other careers. Um, and so I did, and I was pretty good at it. But I had one professor in particular who taught several classes that I took. Um, the first one he taught was a torts class. This is about you know where people um, you know, behave negligently or do something to injure another, and so you can sue in civil court, that kind of thing. I found it interesting from a public policy perspective. He taught a class on corporations, corporate law generally, which is, I think of as sort of being political science in miniature. Um, and I really enjoyed that class. And most of the way through that class, he pulled me aside one day and he said, I'm going to be teaching a class on corporate taxation next semester. I really think you'd like it. Now I know that you have not taken the basic tax class, but if you'll promise to take it at the same time, I will let you take my corporate tax class. Please consider it. And he said, well, this professor would not steer me wrong. I really respect him and he's a really fascinating person, so I'll try it. And I wish I could say that everything changed for me when I started taking corporate tax. It was not immediate, but it really turned into something that I found uh, that by dedicating a lot of time and attention, there was really a fascinating, I would call it an Aristotelian overlay to everything that happens in commercial life, uh, where you have to classify every single thing that people do commercially in order to get a tax outcome. And I was hooked. Um, I could spend as much time as I wanted on this. Um, and it was deeply fascinating, very logical, very detailed, very rule oriented. Um, and so there was a lot to learn. And I found that very attractive. And that is how I started down the path. So you were inspired by a professor. Absolutely. Um, it was one person's uh, enthusiasm for what he did insight into what he did and ability to convey his enthusiasm and insight that led me to trust his suggestion um, and that really was it. How did he associate enthusiasm in taxes? That's something I'm very interested in. <laughs> I know it's hard to imagine that one could ever be enthusiastic about tax and um, I cannot tell you truthfully that I am necessarily enthusiastic about tax. What I am interested in is the practice and the learning and the detail. And 
Part of it, I would say, is simply the fact that there is so much complexity. Um, part of it is the fact that unlike, say, I don't know, structural engineering or something like that, people don't have an intuitive sense about how tax ought to work. When we're talking about physical objects, you know, making things or building things, we all have a sense about how gravity works, how strong a you know, piece of metal ought to be or something like that, how to make something stand up. But in tax, absolutely everything is a creation of the mind. There is nothing that, you know, when you simply walk through a door or do something that everybody automatically feels that had a tax consequence. Uh, one of the things that this professor said, tongue in cheek, but there's still some truth to it, was you should understand that everything that everybody is doing in this town right now has tax consequences. <laughs> and it was the idea that there was this entire philosophical system, you know, silly as some may find it, but there was an entire system that needed to classify all activity that really was the attraction to me and how he was able to convey that. Um, to me, what I found, uh, what made me want to take this up and do more with it. How would you describe your job at GIP? I think most of what I do is try to help us to keep the promises that we have made to investors. GIP is essentially a private equity fund. And what we do is go to investors and ask them for the privilege of investing some of their money in return for which you know, we hope to generate returns for them that are commensurate with our expectations and to earn a fee in the process. In order for us to have the privilege of investing their money, they understandably have an awful lot of strictures, you know, regulations, or requirements that they want us to observe when they do it. I often joke with some of the people who report to me, it's sort of like being at a restaurant. You know, this one wants gluten-free, this one wants sauce on the side, you know, this one wants deliveries between 8 and 9 a.m. That's how we have to do it, but we make an awful lot of promises. So then, once we've gotten the privilege of investing people's money, we will then go look for investments in you know, various jurisdictions that meet the requirements that we've said we can locate or find. When we do that, you can imagine that there are a lot of tax issues that go along with investing, for example, you know, in a foreign country or with a particular type of business. And so we have to find a way to put together all of the promises that we have made to investors with all of the rules that apply to various jurisdiction and come up with something that not only blends those together but also meets our commercial requirements. Because you can imagine, as a business, we have a lot of commercial requirements that we need to satisfy. How you govern an investment, how you work with co-investors whose money you do not manage, those kinds of things. So in the end, I am trying to manage a, an integration of a bunch of different requirements from a bunch of different people into a structure or arrangement that will meet everyone's objectives or sort of not dissatisfy too many people. I would say a lot of my day-to-day -day interactions with the people for whom I work and with whom I work is explaining tax rules to them. You know, what are the constraints with which we have to work and, you know, what do we need to do in order to satisfy various requirements. So I do think of that as a kind of translation. Um, that's a lot of it. And a lot, an important part of what I do is not using all of the technical legal language. I think most people would agree that Lawyers are the way that the law that Congress or legislative bodies enact get out into the general public. That's the interface. That's how it's the method for disseminating the rules that are not necessarily intuitive. And so a lot of my job is translating those rules for the people who need to work with them, whether it's the commercial folks or with the uh, investors with whom we work. Talking about translation, uh, there's sometimes misunderstanding because of the the cultural difference. Is it something you experience in your job? Um, I have not really had problems with cultural differences when it comes to dealing with the rules because most of the frameworks are fairly similar. We can at least understand, oh, it's this sort of an issue or this sort of a problem. What is a, a good infrastructure to invest in for your business? Well, we have a particular investment goal here at GIP, which is, you know, when we think of infrastructure, we probably use the word a little bit differently to the way many academics and other folks use infrastructure. 
Um, as a general matter, what we are looking for at GIP is assets that have high barriers to entry, that are capital intensive, um, that have contractual cash flows, meaning, you know, for example, let's say a power plant. When you build a power plant, usually it's because you've got somebody who needs the power and is willing to enter into a contract to purchase that power. But then what you would do is take the fact that somebody wants to purchase that power and use that effectively as a collateral to help you borrow money so that you could build the plant or operate a pipeline, whatever the case might be. Um, and in the end, you hope to be able to satisfy everybody's needs. So that's what we are talking about when we mean infrastructure. And as I say, that's a little bit different from what most people talk about when they refer to infrastructure like roads, for example. How would you define the type of risk you can take with your investors' money? Well, I guess there the only risk that I'm qualified to talk about is tax risk because, you know, commercial risk, there can obviously be lots and lots of different kinds of risk. Generally speaking, we're not looking to be innovative when it comes to taking tax risk. As a general matter, we're trying to find things, as I mentioned at the outset, that actually work to solve uh, everybody's problems commercially and otherwise, instead of, for example, trying to find a new technique that's going to have dramatic tax savings. Um, I don't think there are too many of those out there. Occasionally, I've seen them, but when it comes to private equity and the type of work we do, that's just generally not what we do. So this series about creativity, where is the creativity in your job? I think it really has to do in two areas. Uh, one you mentioned already, which is translation. Um, one of the things that I enjoy, and I think that I'm reasonably good at, is helping non-technical tax people understand what the rules are and what it is that we have to work with um, without falling into highly technical language that everybody's eyes just glaze over and they, they stop thinking about it. So it does take some careful thought to figure out how to communicate these complex ideas to people who, frankly, often don't want to hear about them in the first instance. The second part of it is really uh, trying to bring together all of these different strands because very few people at the firm have a, an understanding of all of the investor requirements, all of the regulatory requirements, all the commercial requirements, and then it's my job to add to that the tax requirements, the local tax rules and whatever else that go along with this. So it really takes a lot of effort. It is not a, a simple thing to try to integrate all of these competing concerns frequently so that they're all taken care of. Sometimes, for example, it's not even that they're competing. It's that, you know, we just need to make sure that they're all covered, and that in itself is quite a job. But the more interesting and creative part of, of it really comes when we've got two concerns or two issues that are at least facially at odds with one another, and it's partly my task to find a way to make both of those work and come up with a solution that will allow both of them to coexist without, well, just to resolve the tension that I just described. What do taxes represent for you? What I think attracted me to, to tax in the first place was really this notion that almost every single commercial and human activity needs to be classified. And in that regard, I really think that it's an Aristotelian enterprise. Um, and for a mildly OCD person like myself, that is very appealing just because you have to classify um, everything. It also appeals to, uh, believe it or not, my sense of practicality. You know, if I were being, if I were overstating it, I would say to my sense of the tragic because the rules can never be perfect. Um, you're always going to have imperfections. You're always going to have to have places where you can't make a rule fit commercial life perfectly. You will get bad outcomes and those kinds of things. And so what's fascinating to me about tax is trying to have a rules structure that accomplishes almost all of what you want or most of what you want without causing you know fundamental problems and certainly i listen to people say oh a dollar of tax paid is a dollar that i shouldn't have paid and taxes are too high and so on and so forth and about that i really don't have a great deal to say because that to me is not really about tax policy and how you implement a system instead that's just about the amount of taxation i certainly have you know deeply held views about this but i wouldn't want to share them under the circumstances. Instead, it's about how does one design a system 
that allows you to accomplish your taxation goals and how do you work with it. And so that really is this overarching notion of a system uh, that I find, and a practical one, uh, as I say, most many would disagree with that, but a, a practical system that really appeals to me. So that's the philosophical background of it. Yes, yes, that's exactly right. Certainly tax is such a technical area of expertise that most people neither know about it nor want to know about it. They're just grateful. They wish taxes would never be a part of their lives. But um, as you know, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes famously said, you know, taxes are the price I pay for civilization. If you believe that that's the price you pay for civilization, and then the inevitable next question is, well, how am I going to pay for this in a way that seems just accurate, fair, whatever other standards you want to apply? And I'm sure that as I say that, I can hear friends of mine yelling at me about how could you possibly say that our tax system is just fair and so on and so forth. And there would people be people on both ends of the political spectrum with things to say about that. But that really is the, that's the appeal, is how do you make this this thing that needs to be done, how do you do it in a way that um, is acceptable, if not perfect? You were inspired by a professor, and you look like a translator. You look like somebody who make people understand what it is about. I am genuinely fascinated by the fact that we are investing in real assets that have real impacts on real people's lives day to day. You know, this is not purely, you know, this is not just, you know, pure fiction. This is not made up. This is not just financial engineering. This is real assets. And I really like learning about various aspects of how uh, parts of the world work. I won't say how the world works because there are many people in my business who would believe that they know everything that there is to know about how the world works. But it's a very, very important thing to me to try to understand how these huge projects come together, how they're done, what the commercial aspects of them are, what the regulatory aspects of them are. Because for many of us in our day-to-day -day lives, we certainly understand the impacts of these huge projects, but we don't feel them so often day-to-day. -day. And to try to see what's going on there commercially and how it works in the world um, in the capitalist commercial system we have is something that is really fascinating to me and really interesting to learn about. Is there a quote you'd like to share? Oh, geez. Um, well, the best one I have that comes to mind uh, on the spot is the one I already gave you from Oliver Wendell Holmes, which is the taxes are the price I pay for civilization. Um, there are I dare say too few people who believe that um, today. Instead, I hear a lot of railing about uh, the very existence of taxes, um, you know, never mind the system that collects them. But that really, I, I do believe, is what fundamentally motivates what I do. What do you think about these billionaires that uh, ask for more taxes for them? Well, that to me goes back to this question about what's the right level of taxation. Um, and as I say, I've definitely got you know, deeply held views that uh, may or may not be compatible with some of the uh, commercial advising that I do. But my personal view is that, yes, uh, more taxes should be paid. Um, I do believe that it's kind of difficult to see, at least in the United States, the society that we have when there are so many who have so much and there are so many more who have not enough. Um, and that's something that I think could be remedied in a variety of ways, and there's, it's unquestionable in my mind that taxes are a fundamental part of that. They're certainly not the be-all and end-all, but again, that is a function both of tax policy, how you would collect taxes if you were to impose them, but also what the correct level of taxation is, and that's something that so I w I'm very interested in, but uh, is a little bit beyond my purview here. Personally, what is your biggest learning since the beginning of your career in tax? It's almost never as bad as I think it is. So too often, especially in you know my area, because there are so many technical rules, I've had so many moments where I've said, oh my gosh, this is a disaster. Um, you know, this is like the world is coming to an end. You know, this is terrible. This is gonna cost so many people so much money. This is awful. And then usually, when I'm able to step away from it for a few minutes and then go back and think a little bit harder, 
I've overreacted. And so I have learned through enough of those experiences not to overreact when something goes wrong and trust that I will be able to, you know, find a way out of it or that maybe I just overread um, or, or overreacted to something that happened in the first instance. I'm going to leave the room. Please hold the microphone and add whatever you want to the interview. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you, Philippe, for um, having me for the interview. I don't feel that I've been as articulate as I might like to have been. Uh, I hope that I've done enough to answer your thoughtful questions um, without dodging them too far in some cases. But it's been a privilege, and at this point, I don't think I have a great deal to add. Thanks. Thank you, Andy, for sharing your story. It was Sounds Like Portraits, a podcast by Philippe Ungar. Please visit soundslikeportraits.com and if you like this show, remember to leave us a five-star rating on iTunes or a review. It really helps new listeners find us. Thank you. Music Charmeuse de Serpent, composed and conducted by Olivier Glisson. See you soon for the next episode.